Thames House, the London headquarters of the security service MI5. The people who work here are told their identities will always remain secret. And so when a senior MI5 officer came to give evidence at the 7-7 inquests, it was behind closed doors. The court was told that MI5 had no inkling of what was to befall London on the 7th of July. Witness G spoke of MI5's profound regret that it was not able to prevent the bombings. For the families of those who died in the London bombings, this is the first time they've been able to hear directly from the security services. Many believe there were significant intelligence failures. If he was running those training camps with the knowledge of the American Secret Service, it's inconceivable he wasn't passing the information of people who were attending those camps to the Americans. So that then begs the question, why didn't the Americans tell the MI5? Or if they did tell MI5, why wasn't something done? The witness denied there were any significant intelligence failings leading up to 7-7. Was Q not arrested possibly because he was working for you or MI5? I'm not prepared to comment on, on, on any speculation like that. This was Mohammed Sadiq Khan, pictured by West Yorkshire Police in 2001, at a time he attended an outdoor camp in Cumbria with known extremists. MI5 had no inkling. MI5 had no inkling. MI5 had no inkling. The long-awaited inquest starts today into the circumstances surrounding the deaths of those people killed in the July the 7th suicide bombings in London. It will sit before a judge and without a jury and is expected to last for five months. Uh, and I think for, the, for us it would be a, a chance, you know, and if, if, if Lady Justice Hallett wants to hear what we have to say and invites us to come and speak, it would be our chance to finally tell our story and get this put to rest. The proceedings started with a barrister representing the victim family members, reminding the coroner that there was significant intelligence known about two of the bombers that could have been utilised to prevent the attacks. Therefore, they demanded a proper investigation with a wider scope than was being offered. This evening, they emerged to the news that MI5 are once again trying to have forthcoming intelligence evidence heard in secret. I wish that they would work with the inquest and help the inquest. They should be partaking in this investigation proactively, not, do, not using every way they can to avoid being part of it. The inquest ended with an anonymous MI5 agent proclaiming that it was nonsensical and offensive to suggest MI5 bore any responsibility for the 52 deaths. Perhaps what's more nonsensical and offensive is that survivors and family members had to wait five years for any kind of judicial hearing and were flatly refused an inquiry into how and why the attacks took place. Every time this comes up in the press, in the papers, uh, it reopens the wounds. Nick Clegg and David Cameron picked up on this when they were in opposition and scolded Blair for rejecting the public's wishes. The reason people want an independent inquiry is because of the scale of what happened in London on the 7th of July when 52 people were murdered and 700 were injured. The reason people want a full inquiry is to get to the truth. The Int Intelligence and Security Committee is too uh, limited in its ability to investigate these things as thoroughly as is needed. I think Tony Blair has made a mistake, frankly, uh, in ruling this out of hand. But now the coalition is in full swing. They too have shown no interest in getting to the truth behind Britain's most devastating terrorist atrocity. What did take place was an inquest, although it was long overdue. Its scope was limited and the coroner's main goal, without asserting guilt, was to determine how the deaths occurred. This proved extremely difficult because there were no internal post-mortems carried out on the bodies. There is no forensics evidence from the scenes as to what explosives were used. There was no CCTV on the trains or bus to verify the conflicting eyewitness reports. 
and even the locations of the blasts in relation to the passengers have not been adequately determined. The Home Office narrative says, uh, gives locations for three of the alleged bombers um, and says that all, all of them took off their rucksacks containing their bombs, put the rucksacks on the floor and blew themselves up and killed those people and you know destroyed these, these train carriages. Um, but the problem is the Metropolitan Police entered into evidence at the inquests a series of diagrams which do not, for the most part, correspond with where the Home Office narrative says these explosions took place. So to even talk of an official story as to where the explosions exactly where in the carriages the explosions happened is, is a bit of a falsehood because there isn't an official story. The security services don't want to have any blame. They don't want to say if they made an apology it meant that they were guilty of something. And if they are guilty of something it meant that somebody is to blame and nobody wants to be blamed. So 77 is to be forgotten. The investigation was picked up by concerned members of the public, unpaid, unappreciated and often brushed aside by the mainstream media as conspiracy theorists. But six years on, we're still waiting for the government to prove their own conspiracy theory. You know, their theory that there was a conspiracy of four homegrown suicide bombers who were not known to the intelligence agencies, who attacked London using homemade bombs with no outside help, of which there was no inkling it was going to happen. This special report for Wideshut.co.uk will rewind the clocks on 7-7 and pose the questions. What did they know prior to the bombings? And how were the authorities dealing with radical Islam at that time? The prima facie case that the government had some, some kind of dubious relation to the attacks. They failed to act um, either through sheer absolute criminal negligence go through something far worse is is almost a foregone conclusion Uh, we were given no warning uh, by any organisation that this was going to happen. We're told MI5 had no inkling that 7-7 was going to happen. And for many people, that's the end of the story. But does the statement hold up to the evidence? Or is there more to the case than meets the eye? In May 2004, investigative current affairs programme Panorama had a panel of experts discussing how Britain would react to a terrorist attack. Just like the future 7-7 bombings, their scenario included three explosions on the London Underground and one on a road vehicle. Intelligence, emergencies, disasters and planning. They are here to give it to us straight. We're just receiving news of an explosion in the London Underground near Hyde Park. This has not yet been confirmed by the police. We can now go back to our reporter Ian Manning at the Hyde Park Police Cordon. Ian, what's the latest? It's still a very confused picture here, but what I can say is that there have been no further explosions following the three reported on the Piccadilly, Central and Victoria lines. Extensive police cordons are now in place at each of the three affected sites, like the one you can see behind me here. And all these areas, as I understand, have now been evacuated. This is the kind of terrorist attack the government repeatedly says is going to happen. Would Al-Qaeda buy weapons of mass destruction if it could? Certainly. Would it use such weapons? Definitely. We are faced with the realistic possibility of some form of unconventional attack. We need to confront murder on a mass uh, scale. We've been absolutely clear we can't guarantee that there will never be an attack. It's quite likely that they're planning one now. We must be prepared for them to strike whenever and however they can. All these officials were certain attacks were coming, and measures were even put in place to prevent them. 
In the year before the Panorama program, a full-scale mock attack was carried out on the underground to prepare the emergency and security services for the real thing. Then, in April 2005, a few months before the bombings, there was a joint US-UK anti-terror drill with over 12,000 people called Atlantic Blue. Again, one of the scenarios was a terrorist attack on the London Underground. As noted by The Guardian at the time, Charles Clark, the Home Secretary, confirmed that the need to improve underground security had been discussed at a G8 summit. Whitehall sources said the tube had long been the focus of concern. It came out during the 7-7 inquest that on July 1st and July 2nd, just days before the bombings, there was another anti-terror exercise, Operation Hanover. In a chillingly prophetic scenario, police planned for three simultaneous explosions at tube stations. No inkling. Bombings on the underground were clearly one of the government's prime concerns in the months before the attacks. There had been substantial amount of planning that had gone on beforehand in the way we would initially respond and make sure that actually, you know, if the incidents were to happen in London, which it did, with tragic consequences, that we and other agencies initially responded well, we put in place. If the incidents were to happen in London, which it did, on the morning of July 7th, 2005, there was one more anti-terror drill that has caused controversy ever since. Senior Metropolitan Police Officer Peter Power, now a crisis management specialist, who you will remember from the Panorama program, was conducting a tabletop exercise that morning that not only envisaged attacks on the underground involving three simultaneous explosions at three tube stations. Power's scenario also involved the very same underground locations that were attacked in real life that morning. When news bulletins started coming on, people began to say how realistic our exercise was, not realising there really was an attack. Today we were running an exercise for a company, bearing in mind I'm now in the private sector, and we sat everybody down in the city, a thousand people involved in the whole organisation, but the crisis team and the most peculiar thing was we based our scenario on the simultaneous attacks on the underground and mainline station. So we had to suddenly switch an exercise from fictional to real. And one of the first things is, get that bureau number. When you have a list of people missing, tell them. And so it took a long to, time. Just to get this right, you were actually working today on an exercise that envisioned yes. virtually this scenario. Uh, almost precisely. I was up until 2 o'clock this morning because it, it's our job, my own company, Visor Consultants, we specialise in helping people to get their crisis management response. How do you jump from slow time thinking to quick time doing? And we chose a scenario with their assistance which is based on a terrorist attack because they're very close to uh, a property occupied by Jewish businessmen. They're in the city and there are more American banks in the city than there are in the whole of New York. A logical thing to do. And it, I've still so got how, the... I was going to say, how extraordinary today <laughs> must feel for you as, as it unfolds. Although his scenario was quite a coincidence, some activists and researchers immediately fell into the trap of implicating Power himself in the real attacks. Mr Power, we'd like to know who are running, who are running mock terror drills for on 7-7. Which company were you working for? You said it was the precise station. Precise times at the precise three stations. Have you any comment on that? Why have you not been investigated or the company investigated? Why have you not investigated, Mr. Power? 52 people died in those bombings, Mr. Power. 52 people died in those power. It's your duty to investigate it further. You've done nothing. 52 people died, Mr. Power. How did how do you know which three stations? Who helped you choose those three stations? How many people knew before the event? How many people knew, Mr. Power? Oh, sorry, I've got to go in here. 
One documentary even claimed that Powers exercise involved the alleged bombers and they were duped into arriving at London. The problem with these speculations is there's no evidence. Powers exercise was not physical with men on the ground like Atlantic Blue. He was simply lecturing in an office with a small number of employees from Reed Elsevier. If Power really was directly involved, why would he plaster himself on TV? You start out with the bombers, the alleged bombers, were not bombers at all. They were patsies. They weren't in those locations. They weren't on those trains. They weren't on that bus. They did not blow up bombs there. What they, the, the ripple effect narrative says is that they were actors of some sort and they thought that they were playing a role in a terrorism training drill, in the Peter Power terrorism training drill. But <laughs> aside from the fact that there is no evidence whatsoever connecting these four men to Peter Power, to Visor Consultants, to, mm. to Reed Elsevier or anyone else involved in this, aside from that sort of absence of positive evidence, we've got some evidence going against it and that would be the general paranoia of young British Muslim males towards anyone involved in the security services. You know, it's not the easiest thing to go out there and, and find four young British Muslim men who are willing to play the role of fake terrorists. They'd have to be pretty trusting, and I would also say pretty naive, to, to agree to do that. In getting stuck down this cul-de-sac, researchers have failed to follow up other leads. Uh, we've heard something quite extraordinary, could be a coincidence or, or not, that your firm on the very day that the bombs went off in London were running an exercise simulating three bombs going off in the very same tube stations that they went off. How did this happen? Coincidence or were you acting on information that you knew? It's possible that Power was able to pick up such an accurate scenario, not because he was directly involved in the attacks himself, but his colleagues in intelligence had informed him that bombings were highly likely. Attacks had already been planned for, and some of the intelligence is in the public domain. On the morning of 7-7, there was a host of international leaders in the UK. In Glen Eagle, Scotland, Tony Blair, George Bush and others were at the G8 summit. In London, Israeli Finance Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was scheduled for an economic conference. But he never left his hotel room. In the confusion after the attacks, Associated Press reported that Scotland Yard had tipped off the Israeli delegation. Senior Israeli official says Scotland Yard told Israel minutes before explosions that it had received warnings of possible terror attacks. Is that why Mr Netanyahu didn't show up at the conference? Netanyahu and Scotland Yard have since denied the reports, but in this situation it's unlikely they'd openly admit it. The story itself has been reported by other sources and travelled right around the world's media. The Israeli National News Service reported, The Israeli Embassy in London was notified in advance, resulting in Finance Minister Benjamin Netanyahu remaining in his hotel room rather than making his way to the hotel adjacent to the site of the first explosion. Former US counter-terrorism officer Thomas L. Preston concurs. He told an ABC News affiliate, Just before the first blast, Netanyahu got a call from the Israeli embassy telling him to stay in his hotel room. The Israel Insider and German press cited the head of Mossad, Israel's intelligence service, who said, The Mossad office in London received advance notice about the attacks, confirming the earlier AP report. According to Strat4 Global Intelligence, a media and analysis outlet for intelligence professionals, even if British authorities knew some point in advance and warned the Israeli embassy and the Mossad office in London, Israel may have already known about the attack several days before them. Based on rumours within their network, they go as far as suggesting it was Israel that warned Britain. 
Without a proper reinvestigation, it's unlikely that this particular story can ever be 100% proven or disproven. But the pattern starting to emerge suggests the intelligence community and other officials knew far more about the attacks than they've let on. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is, is that there really are some very fundamental questions to be raised about what happened on 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 in, you know on seven seven, um, and they range across a whole host of things on a, on a simple basic level of an intelligence failure, which I guess would be the basic focus of an inquiry, which is why we failed to 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 anticipate this attack. Surely, you know, for a government that is interested in security, the first thing you'd want to do is to understand why we failed. And looking at the evidence that has come out in the public record about the about the kind of advanced warning that was available, it does suggest that we did have a fairly precise indication of what was going to happen. And that does raise questions about why we did fail to act. The 2004 Madrid train bombings reaffirmed the vulnerability of Europe to terrorist attacks. In the September, Pakistan's ISI warned that Abu Faraj al-Libi, al-Qaeda's alleged third in command, was planning to attack Britain and had sent coded messages to British extremists. The Telegraph reported that al-Libi had taken charge of sleeper cells in Britain and the United States and that at least two British-based militants travelled to Pakistan to finalise details. US officials say the arrest of Abu Faraj al-Libi resulted from years of painstaking detective work, penetrating the Al-Qaeda network and tracking him as he moved from remote tribal regions to finally on Monday night, a cemetery 30 miles north of Peshawar. After his arrest, he was handed over to the United States. His secret notebooks revealed plans to replicate the Madrid bombings in another European city. He warned US interrogators that the London mass transit system was a likely target. Then, on November 8, 2004, while speaking to the Confederation of British Industry, MI5 head Eliza Manningham Buller reiterated the threat, stating there might be major attacks like Madrid and that this threat was serious and sustained. Spanish intelligence confirmed this with their March 2005 warning, which claimed the mastermind of the Madrid attacks himself had identified Britain as a likely target. Then, just weeks before the bombings, French intelligence issued a report, warning of an imminent attack on Britain. They say the plot emanated from pro-jihadi sympathies within Britain's large Pakistani communities. A leaked document that was sent to Tony Blair shows he was fully aware of the threat, which was compounded by his illegal invasion of Iraq. A number of reports you know, in the public record, mainstream sources, say that Israeli intelligence, Saudi intelligence, and French intelligence, at the very least, all gave warnings of an imminent attack on London. Um, a number of them were specific. The Saudis said that there was going to be an attack on the London Underground. They even indicated a day that it would be in July. Now, why was that not acted on? No questions have been, enough, have been asked. You know. This Saudi warning was picked up by The Guardian, who reported that specific details of a plot to bomb the London Underground involving a terror cell of four people were passed to MI6 in December 2004. We have sent information to Great Britain before the terrorist attacks in Britain, um, but unfortunately no action was taken. A Saudi source told the Observer, When we heard about the bombs in London, we immediately recalled the warning we had given Britain, in particular the fact that four individuals carried out the attack and that it happened almost in the timescale we were told about. Despite all of this data, on the 2nd of June, just over a month before the attacks, the terror threat level was lowered and police were moved out of the city. The official announcement stated, At present there is not a group with both the current intent and the capability to attack the UK. So on one hand officials were openly worried about attacks on the underground, 
they were receiving warnings from several international intelligence agencies about an imminent threat and were conducting drills and exercises in preparation. Yet, on the other hand, they lowered the threat level, stated nobody was planning to attack, and have since claimed they had no inkling that anything like this was going to take place. Subsequent government investigations have never adequately addressed this massive contradiction. Following the first lacklustre narrative that couldn't even get the train times correct, two more reports on 7-7 were released in 2006 and 2009. They aim to look more closely at some of the intelligence data and what the agencies knew before the attacks. And although they did concede that officials saw the London Underground as a target way back in 2003, they didn't mention the possible foreknowledge involving Israel or any of the details of the warnings from Pakistan, the US, Spain or France. They glossed over the Saudi warning as media speculation. Hello, welcome to the Foreign Matters video blog, titled 77 plus 2000 spooks minus 52 essentials. The headlines are that the ISC concludes that MI5 and the police cannot be criticised for the actions and decisions they took in 2004 and 5, even if there were, with hindsight, quote, missed opportunities. The victims' families say the reports are whitewashed. Some sensitive material is censored. The breakdown of communication between MI5 and the police is not properly dealt with. And the claim that the Saudis warned the UK in advance of 7-7 is completely redacted. This means we have to have blind faith in the very agencies that were supposedly being evaluated by these reports. The Intelligence and Security Committee is made up of parliamentarians appointed directly by the Prime Minister, and they can only work with what MI5 and MI6 allow. Hardly a thorough, impartial and transparent way to carry out an investigation. At what point do mistakes become criminal negligence? We heard that operational officers carrying out surveillance programmes do not keep written notes and records of what they do and the decisions they make. And at what point does a lack of transparency become a cover-up? For me, these are the issues that still need to be known. What did the MI5 know before and how has it come to light or not come to light? There's far more to the story than simply underestimating the warning signs. MI5 may have actually known about two of the alleged bombers and failed to apprehend them. Although there have been suspicions and anecdotal evidence of a fifth or more bombers, the official 7-7 story claims that only four homegrown extremists were responsible for the attacks. They were Mohammed Sadiq Khan, aged 30, from Beeston, Leeds, accused of the Edgware Road Blast. Shizad Tanweer, aged 22, also from Beeston, accused of the Liverpool Oldgate Blast. Jamaican-born Jermaine Lindsay, aged 19, from Aylesbury, said to have bombed the carriage heading for Russell Square Station. And Hasib Hussein from Holbeck, Leeds, the youngest at just 18, said to have blown himself up on the number 30 bus outside of Tavistock Square. The original Home Office narrative claimed the alleged bombers were clean skins, unknowns to the intelligence agencies. After further pressure, the later ISC report conceded that Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shizad Tanweer were on the periphery of another investigation. Uh, on 2005, the Home Secretary stated quite clearly that he'd been told by the intelligence community that the four bombers were previously unknown to them, they were clean skins. They couldn't prevent the attack because it had come out of the blue. Now, now, since 2005, we know that that's now completely untrue. After a 15-month court order was lifted following the trial of that other investigation, it was revealed that Khan and Tanweer had been directly surveilled by MI5 before the attacks. Why do they think that they can lie to the Home Secretary and, and not be accountable to him? Just who, who are they accountable to? The trial was in relation to Operation Crevice, which culminated in dawn raids during March 2004. 
It targeted a cell of Islamic extremists who they believed were planning to blow up targets across England with fertilizer bombs. Anti-terror operation finds half a ton of bomb-making material have been arrested across. <laughs> The intelligence agencies have never released data about other suspects who were not central to the Crevice trial, but their story is that out of 55 individuals surveilled, future 7-7 bombers Mohammed Sadiq Khan and Shizad Tanweer represented just 0.1% of the investigation. 15 of the 55 were allegedly graded as essential because they had been overheard discussing terrorist activity with the alleged ringleader Omar Khayyam or his associates. Therefore, MI5 couldn't be held accountable for 7-7 because Khan and Tan Weir were never focused on during Operation Crevice. This argument is a hodgepodge of nonsense. During the surveillance of the suspects, Khan and Tan Weir were photographed, videotaped and even tailed. On one occasion, Khan is spotted in Crawley at the wheel of a vehicle. He is joined by the alleged crevice ringleader Omar Khayyam, Shizad Tanweer and others. They're tailed, and when Khayyam exits the vehicle, MI5 follow the group to the M1 Toddington Services Station in Bedfordshire. Here, Khan and Tanweer are photographed before heading to Beeston, where Khan drops everybody else off, their address is noted. Khan then carried on to a family home in Dewsbury. When police ran checks on the vehicle, it was registered to his wife, which meant nothing at the time, but they kept a close eye, noting which garage it had once been repaired at, and later tracing it to his mother-in-law's home. It also turns out that Khan was in fact recorded talking about terrorism with crevice ringleader Omar Khayyam, among other criminal activities. So are you really a terrorist? They're working with us. You're serious, you, you are basically? I'm not a terrorist, but they're working through us. Who are? There's no one higher than you. The majority of the conversation focused on financial fraud and Khan's plans to go overseas for jihad. Khayyam, who appeared to be a mentor, gave Khan advice. This is a one-way ticket, bruv, yeah? You agree with that, yeah? You're happy with this? Because you're going to leave now. You might as well rip the country apart economically as well. All the brothers are running scams. All the brothers that are leaving are doing it. With regards to the baby, I'm debating whether or not to say goodbye and so forth. And inshallah, when the time comes for me to leave, by telling them you love them, bruv. You love them, bruv. You love them for deem. It's because we love the Islamic way of life this much that we stay away from them. I know it's better for me. According to court testimony, that same night, Khan attended a meeting with Khayyam and members of the fertilizer plot, although MI5 were not able to listen in. The surveillance continued when Khan, Tanweer and Khayyam were followed to a meeting in Wellingborough East Midlands. They continued to talk about financial fraud, which the authorities believe was to raise money to fund terrorism overseas. The final time Khan was logged by MI5 was during a meeting at Khayyam's flat in Slough. We know that the intelligence community had been had a full surveillance team in place, shadowing or following, or whatever they do, uh, Mohammed Siddiqui Khan for over two years. They had tape recordings of him in contact with people who are now serving sentences for, plan for planning bomb attacks. They, they had followed him to his home address, so they had a full surveillance team. So the first question is, why did they lie to the Home Secretary? What are the consequences of that? Because there don't seem to have been any. But also, it's really, really upsetting for me and all of us to know that the intelligence community had such detailed information about Siddiqui Khan and his intent, and yet they didn't act. So the key question for me is, why didn't they act? Why didn't they prevent this? If all this surveillance represented just 0.1% of the investigation surrounding Crevice, it must have been a gigantic investigation. And what of the 15 essentials? Only 7 men from Britain went to trial. And what of the other 40 men on the periphery? If they were in the same category as Khan and Tanweer, 
who met Omar Khayyam several times and were recorded doing so, that's a pretty extensive surveillance library and Khayyam must have had a very large social group. Considering the lack of transparency up until that point, were MI5 trying to downplay the amount of information they actually had? In June 2004, after the fertiliser plot had been foiled, the surveillance team ran a second check on the car frequently driven by Khan. This time it was registered in his name. The security services have always claimed that even though they had all this surveillance, he wasn't already known to them and his name was never flagged up in their systems. This however might not be entirely true. When investigators looked into the alleged bomber's history, it led them to the Ikra Islamist bookshop in Beeston. Both Khan and Tanweer volunteered there and their names had previously been put on file in relation to the surveillance of another employee. That employee was Martin McDade, an ex-marine and anti-terrorism operator who converted to Islam in the 90s and changed his name to Abdullah. Hugo Keith QC revealed at the 7-7 inquest that McDade was known to the security services and West Yorkshire police since at least 1998 and was suspected of being involved in extremist activities since then. The inquest heard testimony that McDade would show deeply offensive pictures and videos to viewers at the bookshop. One employee said it was McDade who was doing most of the ranting and raving. With this in mind, it's reasonable to assume that McDade was influential to the young would-be bombers. Could this influence have played a role in 7-7? In January 2001, McDade and the owner of the Ikra bookshop, Taf Mohammed, were under MI5 and police surveillance. Operation Warlock observed what was called a camping retreat of extremists that they'd organised in the Lake District, and one man caught on video was Mohammed Sadiq Khan. Later, in 2003, during a deeper investigation codenamed Operation Honeysuckle, Khan and Shizad Tanweer are noted by police as trustees of the bookshop. Their names were now on file. Furthermore, in April 2003, Khan was noted as somebody who had given a lift to McDade in a BMW. Following the 7-7 bombings, McDade tried to distance himself from Khan and Tanweer, saying their interactions amounted to just saying hi and goodbye. This is fundamentally different from going on a trip to the Lake District and sharing a vehicle. It was around the time of the Honeysuckle surveillance that Operation Crevice began. The initial investigation was not targeted at Omar Khayyam or suspicions of a fertiliser plot, but a man named Mohammed Qayyum Khan, often shortened to Q. Q was said to have direct contact with Al-Qaeda, so the spooks began a surveillance operation at an Islamic centre he frequented. They said he would regularly recruit young Muslims for jihad overseas. In July 2003, MI5 discovered phone calls had been made by Q to none other than Mohammed Sadiq Khan at the Ikra bookshop. In the ISC report, they claim the name meant nothing to them. But what about the previous investigations into the bookshop? According to an MI5 document shown at the inquest, the phone number was first filed on the 11th of March, during Operation Honeysuckle. So why didn't they make the connection? Checks on Q's phone call should have revealed the previous entries that listed Khan and Tanweer as trustees at the bookshop, and a check on Khan's name should have revealed the entry about his BMW and association with Martin McDade and Taf Mohammed. Was this an oversight? Why has nobody been held accountable? Potentially, lives could have been saved. The world's intelligence agencies employ a number of covert practices which they claim help gather information and reduce terrorist threats.
They include the use of secret informants, members of a terrorist group or somebody known to a group who divulge information about them to the agency. Infiltrators, agents that gain the trust of a group who then pass on information or steer the group into a sting operation. Intelligence assets, somebody of importance to the agency because of their position in a group, who may or may not be an informant and who may not necessarily know their role or how they are being used, and patsies, somebody being manipulated by an agency who is set up or left to take the blame for something. These practices are highly controversial because of the possibility of intelligence agencies turning a blind eye, being complicit or even responsible for terrorism. It is strongly suspected that British security services knew about the 1998 Omar bombings in advance, but deliberately held back intelligence so one of their IRA infiltrators wasn't exposed. The 2009 Detroit underpants bomber was a suspected FBI asset and patsy. Despite not having a passport and being on a terror watch list, witnesses saw an agent escort him past security and directly onto the plane. The US government escorted him through security without a passport and we believe gave him an intentionally defective bomb. They claim they wanted to monitor him inside the US in case he led to a bigger network of terrorists. There have been numerous cases where our unilateral and uncoordinated revocation of the visa would have disrupted important investigations that were underway by one of our national security partners. They had the individual under investigation and our revocation action would have disclosed U.S. government's interest in that individual and ended our colleagues' ability, such as the FBI, to pursue the case quietly and to identify terrorist plans and co-conspirators. In reality, lives were put at risk and new invasive security measures were wheeled out at airports even though he was allowed onto the plane. In regards to 7-7, there is some evidence that extremists who influenced the alleged bombers were in fact linked to intelligence agencies. Although Operation Crevice began as an investigation into Mohammed Qayyum Khan, aka Q, he is still a free man. He was not really focused on in the trial and wasn't even called as witness. You'd think an Al-Qaeda facilitator would be high on MI5's wanted list, but as far as we know, he hasn't been investigated since. Who was or is Q? There are a lot of people connected to this investigation. Some of them I know their identities, some of them I don't. Um, but you know who Q is? I know who Q is, but I'm not going to discuss uh, who he is or what he is or what he does uh, during this interview. The mainstream press suspected he was really an informant who the authorities protected in return for his cooperation. But if Q was working for MI5, there's a huge implication. During the Crevice trial, it was claimed one of the young men he sent to Pakistan for terrorism training during this time frame was alleged 7-7 bomber Mohammed Sadiq Khan. None of this was explored by the inquest. Why was Q never arrested? Decisions are made during the course of investigation based upon the evidence that's available. And uh, the, the decision as to who should be arrested is based entirely uh, upon what evidence is available at the time. Was Q not arrested possibly because he was working for you or MI5? I'm not prepared to comment on, on, on any speculation like that. Although it's not beyond the realm, it does seem odd that a white British man who'd served as an anti-terror operator and Royal Marine would suddenly convert to Islam and begin preaching hate. Considering the 90s saw a big influx of radical Islamist groups, it's without a doubt that MI5 was keeping a close eye and infiltrating the Muslim community. Why was McDade never questioned about his connection to the alleged 7-7 bombers and their time at the Ikra bookshop? Were the security services protecting him? Martin McGutland is his real name, but this is not his real face. The man who infiltrated the IRA and fed its secrets to the British security forces has many disguises. So far, they've kept him alive. 
Infiltration tactics were commonplace during the Irish Troubles, with several leading members of the IRA and Sinn Féin turning out to be British agents. One of the most well-known was agent codenamed Steakknife, whose infiltration went as far as murder. As stated in court by one British agent who worked as an infiltrator, I am a former member of the British Army. I was asked to infiltrate a terrorist group, namely the Provisional IRA, as part of my undercover work for the Force Research Unit. I was active in the commission of terrorist acts and crimes. Did Martin McDade do similar undercover work while he was associated with the Ikra bookshop? Since its closing down, Taf Mohammed has worked for Scotland Yard and a string of councils to run training courses about engaging Muslim youths. This is far cry from the days when he was surveilled for allegedly organising terror training camps in the Lake District. Could Taf have been working for the authorities the whole time? Omar Khayyam, the eventual focus of Operation Crevice, is also another interesting figure that surrounded the alleged 7-7 bombers. Some of his bugged conversation with Khan suggests there's more to his story than meets the eye. So are you really a terrorist? They're working with us. You're serious? You, you are basically? I'm not a terrorist, but they're working through us. Who are? Who are indeed. According to Kayam's testimony at the trial, he attended a terror training camp in Pakistan that was run by the ISI, the country's intelligence service. What was the ISI, an ally of Western intelligence agencies since the late 70s, doing training British Muslims for jihad and terrorism post 9-11? Were MI5 or the American CIA aware of this? As the trial went on, he kept tight-lipped, saying the ISI had had words with his family and he couldn't go any further in order to protect them. Because of this, it's not entirely clear what his relationship with the ISI was, or what Britain may have known about it. During another bugged conversation, he seemed to have prior knowledge of the very raid he was arrested in. I don't even live in Crawley anymore. I moved out because in the next month they're going to start raiding big time all over the UK. Was Kayam some kind of asset for the ISI? Was he tipped off about the raids? Did he refuse to talk because it would have exposed this relationship and put his relatives at risk? He's currently serving life behind bars for his role in the fertilizer plot. So as far as the state's concerned, their job is done. Much of the testimony from the crevice trial that put five men behind bars came from an American. Mohammed Junaid Babar, known as the Al-Qaeda Supergrass, was brought up in Queens, New York. Following 9-11, he vowed to join his brothers in Afghanistan and kill the American invaders. I'm willing to kill the American soldiers if they enter into Afghanistan with their ground troops. I'm willing to kill the Americans and if the Americans use Pakistan soil as its basis, we will kill them here in Pakistan too. The ironic twist here is that Babar's mother was on the ninth floor of one of the World Trade Towers when it was attacked. However, this didn't deter him from becoming an Al-Qaeda facilitator, providing equipment and finance for terrorists training in Pakistan. Babar had visited Britain several times despite being a known terrorist and had met with those surrounding the fertiliser plot. Because of this, he became the Crevice trial star prosecution witness and was said to have an insight as an insider into the events and plans which an outsider could not have. He was granted immunity because of this cooperation. At the time, he was an informant for the FBI, having been arrested after returning to the US in April 2004. They took him to the Embassy Hotel, detained and then arrested him and interviewed him for six months. Baba talked, hoping for a more lenient sentence. 
One of the most controversial aspects of Babar's story came when he admitted to setting up a training camp in Pakistan that was attended by future 77 bomber Mohammed Sadiq Khan. At one point while in custody, he had the chance to identify the man he trained. But remember the photo MI5 had taken of Khan and Tanweer at the Toddington Services Station? Due to the absolutely horrendous photocopy that was sent to US authorities, Babar didn't recognise him. The fact that MI5 sent the image shows that they were putting more man-hours into investigating the alleged bombers than they'd like to admit. But more importantly, why did a clear colour photo become a poorly cropped black and white photocopy that left them unidentifiable? At the very least, it's a case of criminal negligence. I think they could have made a better effort. They could have stuck it on a jumbo jet and got it there overnight if they really wanted to. They could have sent it over with a member of the security services or the Metropolitan Police. But we also have to consider that for whatever reason, maybe MI5 didn't want them to be identified. Another confusing aspect of the Babar story is the fact that he thought he could freely fly to America in 2004 and not be apprehended. The media suggested that he may have been a US informant even prior to his official arrest. This was later corroborated in 2011 when he was released by American authorities having served only four and a half years of a possible 70 year sentence. Court documents confirm that Mr. Babar began cooperating even before his arrest, suggesting he may have been an informant while running training camps in Pakistan. The judge for his release celebrated his exceptional cooperation, but 7-7 victim family members rightfully didn't. To hear that the American judicial system praised Barber for cooperating with the police after he'd been arrested or gave himself in, um, doesn't diminish what he did. He, he was directly responsible for the deaths of dozens and dozens of people. And four and a half years is totally inappropriate. Every time I hear that Barber has been released or he, early or he was on bail for two years and so has been wandering the streets of America free, in fact, I hear he's now, that he's now married with children himself, fills me with anger because it points to complicity with the American Secret Service in his role in Pakistan. And that suggests then that whilst but Barber was running the training camps, training people to commit mass murder. That was with the full knowledge of the American Secret Service. If he was running those training camps with the knowledge of the American uh, Secret Service, it's inconceivable he wasn't passing information of people who were attending those camps to the Americans. So that then begs the question, why didn't the Americans tell the MI5? Or if they did tell MI5, why wasn't something done? What justice is there when the man who sent one of the alleged 77 bombers to Pakistan and the man who operated the training camp are both walking free and may have been informants the whole time? A name that cropped up following the 77 bombings was that of Haroon Rashid Aswat. He was a known terrorist who was wanted for trying to establish Al-Qaeda cells in the United States and who called himself a hitman for Bin Laden. FBI documents say he travelled from Britain to the US state of Oregon in 1999 to give arms training to potential American extremists, while keeping close ties to Abu Hamza, once preacher of Britain's infamous Finsbury Park Mosque. Two weeks before 7-7, he managed to sneak back into the UK through a seaport. Immediately, Special Branch contacted MI5 because Aswat was listed on a Pakistani terrorist watch list and was wanted for the Oregon charges by the US. Instead of apprehending him right there, or at least carefully tracking his movements, MI5 ignored the warning because they considered him too low risk to worry about. Following the bombings, Aswat was widely reported in the media as the 7-7 mastermind, an Al-Qaeda operative pulling the strings of the alleged bombers. The press cited intelligence sources who claimed that there were up to 20 phone calls between Aswat and the bombers. Khan was said to have phoned Aswat on the morning of the attacks. 
What makes this story even more intriguing is claims that Aswat was some kind of intelligence informant. Former Royal Marines Commando Christopher Berry D wrote in The New Criminologist that Aswat was working for MI6 and this was confirmed by leading US and French intelligence sources. Former Army Intelligence Officer and US Prosecutor John Loftus shared this view with Fox News. Aswat is believed to be the mastermind of all the bombings in London. From on the 7-7 and 7-21, this is the guy, we think. This is the guy, and what's really embarrassing is that you, the entire British police are out chasing him, and one wing of the British government, MI6, or the British Secret Service, right. has been hiding him. And this has been a real source of contention between CIA, Hold on, John. Justice Department, and Britain. MI6 has been hiding him. Are you saying that he has been working for them? Oh, I'm not saying it. This is what the Muslim Sheik said in an interview in a British newspaper back in 2001. So he's a double agent. Absolutely. Now, we knew about this guy, Aswat. Back in 1999, he came to America. The Justice Department wanted to indict him in Seattle because him and his buddy were trying to set up a terrorist training school in Oregon. So they indicted his buddy, right? But why didn't they indict him? Well, it comes out, we've just learned that the headquarters of the U.S. Justice Department ordered the Seattle prosecutors not to touch Aswat. Hello. Now, hold on. Why? And that's, well, apparently Aswat was working for British intelligence. Yet, as fast as the story circulated that Aswat was involved in 7-7, it simply disappeared from the official narrative. Did intelligence sources feed the press disinfo? Did they make the whole story up? Was the story suppressed because Aswat was some kind of informant? Nothing has ever been clarified, not least by the inquest. Following the bombings, Aswat left for Pakistan and was later arrested in Zambia. He was then deported to the UK where he was held, not for 7-7, but on extradition to the US for the Oregon training camp charges. He is still stuck in the UK system. One of the things I would mention is, for example, is, is the case of Harun Rashid Aswat, who was originally described as the 7-7 mastermind. And at the same time, we had press reports coming out from the Times. We had, um, we had, a, a, we had John Loftus from the Justice Department coming on Fox News and actually saying that this guy, Harun Rashid Aswat, 7-7 mastermind, was recruited by MI6 he was, an, he was Al Mahajirun, who he was working with, this network, was recruited by MI6 in the 90s. They were using British Muslims, manipulating them, getting them to go to Kosovo and get involved in dirty CIA covert ops and that kind of thing. And this guy was a 7-7 mastermind. And what happened thereafter, once this was leaked, there was a complete backtrack. And all of the evidence that was being cited, evidence from phone records that Harun Rashid Aswat had phoned, the alleged 7-7 bombers, Muhammad Sadiq Khan, Cesar Tanwir in the days and, and weeks leading up to the attack and phoned them on the morning of the attacks, just before the attacks and that there were discussions about bombs and how to create bombs and all this kind of thing, technical discussions that they had discovered. All of this was suddenly swept under the carpet and Harun Rashid Aswat was, was, was basically made out to be nothing to do with 7-7 whatsoever. That issue just kind of brings to light some of these questions about Deep politics. What is our relationship to international terrorism? What is our relationship to Al-Qaeda? You know, we're using these guys. What's going on here? How, when did this stop? Has it really stopped? One may ask themselves, why were there all these radicals and potential terrorists with links to networks overseas residing in Britain in the years leading up to 7-7? That question is a long and complex one that includes elements of collusion by the state and security services with the extremists. It was as if there were an unspoken deal. We don't arrest them and they don't attack us. In his book, What Went Wrong? 7-7 The London Bombs, Former British Army officer and intelligence expert Crispin Black wrote of a secret government policy known as the Covenant of Security. He says this refers to the long-standing British habit of providing refuge and welfare to Islamist extremists 
on the unspoken assumption that if we give them a safe haven, they will not attack on these shores. French intelligence call this policy with contempt, Lundunistan. The CIA and the Israelis all accused MI6 of letting all these terrorists live in London, uh, not because they were getting Al-Qaeda information, but for appeasement. It was one of those, you leave us alone, we leave you alone kind of things. Under the Covenant, Britain spent years harboring hate-filled preachers like Abu Hamza, former Imam of the Finsbury Park Mosque, and Omar Bakri, former leader of al Mahajarun, now Muslims Against Crusades. In fact, at various stages, both men were assets of MI5 and MI6. Allah Habib. Uh, Kafir is walking by. He went. He went inside. You catch him. What, what, what are you doing here? Then he's a boot. You can sell him the market. If Muslims cannot take them to the to, and you know and sell them in the, in the market, then you just kill him. It's okay. Abu Hamza became an informant for Special Branch and MI5 in 1997, and despite his inflammatory sermons and role in recruiting Muslims for jihad, he was told that what he was doing fell under freedom of speech. You don't have to worry unless we see blood on the streets, the authorities told him. While they were turning a blind eye, Hamza was training young men how to use AK-47s, handguns and mock rocket launchers during country retreats. He was preparing them for the tougher camps they'd face overseas, which the authorities also knew he was funding. Authors O'Neill and McGrory would comment, The admission that Abu Hamza and his followers were using Britain to raise funds to finance terrorism overseas did not seem to cause a blip on MI5's radar. Hamza was so protected on British soil that the French even considered kidnapping him to stop his operation. Egypt were so concerned that they offered to swap him for a British prisoner, but they were turned down. He would go on to be linked to terrorism and kidnappings of Westerners overseas. He would regularly praise suicide bombings, violent jihad and Osama bin Laden and would even call for planes to be bombed out of the sky. The idea is to slow down and make the sky very high risk. When an airplane goes down now, is it a Lockerbie or an SOS net? Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, was a regular attendee of Hamza's Finsbury Park Mosque before he attempted to down American Airlines Flight 63. All of this was under the watchful eye of British intelligence. Hamza's influence also did not escape those surrounding the future 7-7 bombings. Alleged bombers Mohammed Sadiq Khan, Shizad Tanweer and Jermaine Lindsay had all attended his sermons at various stages. Haroon Rashid Aswat, who may have made phone calls to the alleged bombers prior to 7-7, was a close friend of Hamza. According to the FBI, it was Hamza who sent Aswat to open training camps in Oregon. Eventually, the hook-handed cleric was sentenced for various terrorism charges and currently is being held on remand whilst the US seeks to extradite him. But he leaves over two decades of extremist influence, of which Britain has yet to fully recover. Britain's other leading radical, Omar Bakri, head of al Mahajarun, was also allowed to operate. I work here in accordance with the covenant of peace which I made with the British government when I got political asylum, he said in an interview. The British government knows who we are. MI5 has interrogated us many times. I think now we have something called public immunity. The Covenant, however, didn't stop Bakri vowing to take over Britain and grooming young men for jihad. Islam the future for Britain. Islam will dominate the whole world. Remember our campaign is continued. The struggle will continue until Islam will dominate the whole world. Like Hamza, Bakri also had ties to those surrounding 7-7. Mohammed Qayyum Khan, aka Q, was said to be a former associate of both fundamentalist clerics. 
Bakri was also an early influence on crevice ringleader Omar Khayyam, who became a member of al Mahajarun during his sixth form education. At one time, Bakri had even been invited to speak at his school. The name Bakri comes to mind, and I do know that after his visit, a, a number of elements of the school community did say to me, well, did I realise that this was no ordinary cleric, and he did have uh, particular views about uh, the role of Islam and, and the political context in which he was operating. Omar joined al Muhajirun. When he left school, he went to Pakistan to train for jihad, but he never told his parents. His family had to drag him back. He returned to Crawley, radicalised and unrecognisable from the Omar his teachers had known. American informant Junaid Babar, the crevice trial star witness and who trained Mohammed Sadiq Khan in Pakistan, was inspired by Bakri during trips to the UK in the 90s and was associated with a New York branch of al Mahajarun. According to Mohammed Sadiq Khan's brother, Khan himself was a follower of Bakri's school of Islam and there have also been claims that he was friends with two al Mahajarun members who committed suicide attacks in an Israeli bar in 2003. Following the London bombings, Bakri's covenant of peace was broken. He fled the country and was banned from returning. In the days and weeks since the 7th of July, Many have raised concerns about extremists. The government briefed that it was considering whether to charge extremist clerics whose preaching might incite terrorism. One man high on the government's list of those soon to be deported is almost certainly Omar Bakri Mohammed. The radical Muslim cleric Omar Bakri Mohammed has been banned from setting foot on British soil again. He left Britain six days ago and has been staying in Lebanon with his mother. Today the Home Office said his presence in Britain is not conducive to the public good. In 2010, Bakri was sentenced to life in prison in Lebanon. He was accused of setting up an anti-government militia. It's hard to understand why there was such a careless policy of appeasement. Was Britain really in such a position that it was safer to harbour extremists than it was to challenge them? One possibility is that the Covenant was really to benefit Britain's foreign policy goals. During Blair and Clinton's involvement in the Balkans, young British Muslims were secretly permitted to attend overseas terrorism training. People who are interested for jihad, uh, it would be arranged for them that they go, they will be trained, they will be fight, and they will kill. They will be killed in the end. The CIA and MI6 were backing the Muslims against the Serbians, using groups like the Kosovo Liberation Army to wage a war against Milosevic. In appeasing extremists at home and allowing them to join the fight, it may have strengthened this agenda. Omar Bakri explains this during an interview with the Jamestown Foundation. I used to encourage people to go to Bosnia to help their Muslim brothers and sisters when the law in the UK permitted that type of intervention. We used to help mostly in Bosnia and Kosovo as part of a broader humanitarian effort. Michael Meacher, MP for Oldham West and Royton, who was sacked by the Labour Party in 2003 for opposing the illegal war in Iraq, also discussed this collusion in the Asian Guardian. Britain's security services helped to create Islamic warriors who eventually bit back against the West. Meacher pointed to a report by a Delhi-based research foundation which estimated that about 200 Pakistani Muslims living in the UK went to Pakistan, trained in HUA camps and joined the HUA's contingent in Bosnia. Most significantly, this was with full knowledge and complicity of the British and American intelligence agencies. The HUA was an offshoot of the original Mujahideen that were backed by the US during the Soviet-Afghan war in the 80s and would eventually give birth to Al-Qaeda. According to Meacher, the US wanted to raise another jihadi corps, again using proxies, to help Bosnian Muslims fight to weaken the Serb government's hold on Yugoslavia. As reported by The Guardian in an article entitled CIA's Bastard Army Ran Riot in Balkans, 
The CIA has been allowed to run riot in Kosovo with a private army designed to overthrow Slobodan Milosevic. Now he's gone, the US State Department seems incapable of reining in its bastard army. According to Lord Stevens, former commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, in total, up to 3,000 British-born or British-based people have passed through terror training camps. It is this wider context that is rarely explored in relation to the events of 7-7. It's easy for the government to say four crazy Muslims attacked Britain, but things get a lot more complicated when those four crazy Muslims grew up in an extremist environment which the government themselves permitted. On one hand, we're told we're fighting a war on terror, but on the other hand, we help support the terrorists. What's more worrying is that we may not have learned our lesson about this appeasement and collusion. The bombing campaign against Libya was in support of what the government call Libyan rebels. But what they fail to tell the public is that those rebels are Muslim extremists. Rebel commanders have admitted their ties to Al-Qaeda and that some of the rebels have previously killed Western soldiers. Al-Qaeda's flag is raised above courthouses and the country has adopted Sharia law after previously being a very successful socialist state. Until our government and intelligence agencies are fully investigated, we can only assume that they'll continue to put us at risk in order to benefit their foreign policy. Since at least the 90s, the government and its intelligence agencies put Britain at risk by harbouring Muslim extremists and allowing them to groom young British men for jihad overseas when it suited their foreign policy. Simultaneously, officials and experts feared the London Underground was a target for terrorism. They made a programme about it and conducted various drills and exercises in preparation some that were almost identical to 7-7 itself. These exercises were in part justified by numerous warnings from international intelligence agencies about an imminent threat to Britain, some which labelled the London transit system as a target, and one warning by Saudi Arabia claiming to have identified that an attack was planned in July by four people. The media and various intelligence professionals, including the head of Mossad itself, reported that Scotland Yard and the Israeli government may have had prior knowledge about the attacks, hours if not days in advance. Despite all this, the terror threat level was lowered in the days before the bombings, claiming nobody was about to attack Britain. Following the bombings, MI5 quickly denied any prior knowledge or wrongdoing, calling the alleged bombers clean skins. It was only after family members and researchers pointed out these contradictions and the holes in the police investigation and government narrative that they reluctantly conceded that they'd actually surveilled at least two of the alleged bombers 18 months before the attacks. Further research revealed that they were photographed, audio recorded, tailed and videotaped on several occasions, and that Khan and Tanweer's names, a bookshop where they worked, and a vehicle and phone used by Khan were all already on police file, even before the surveillance they admit took place. One image of the bombers was so poorly cropped and copied that the only conclusion can be that MI5 are fumbling idiots or somebody deliberately sabotaged the investigation. Other serious questions have been raised about the possibility that clerics who preached to the alleged bombers and their associates, Martin McDade and Taf Mohammed who influenced Khan and Tanweer at the Ikra bookshop, Q who sent Khan to terror training in Pakistan, Omar Khayyam who gave Khan advice before he left, Junaid Babar who operated the camp, and Haroon Aswat who may have advised the bombers in the days before the attacks, may have all at some point been working for governments and intelligence agencies that were supposed to be protecting the people from terrorism. Although this scenario might not be 100% accurate, 
Due to the secrecy of the intelligence agencies and the government, it's not always clear where the information ultimately leads or what information is yet to be uncovered. But there is enough of it in the public domain to throw the official story into doubt and to warrant a reinvestigation or public inquiry. Mr. Folks, you want an inquest. Why? Uh, uh, an inquiry, I beg your pardon. Why? Well, before the inquest started, the most important job was to set out the scope of the inquest and about what could and what couldn't be looked at. And that meant that huge amounts of important work were ignored and so that the inquest had a very, very narrow uh, remit. And once the inquest then got underway, we started to uncover more and more important information, but that it was ruled out of scope. And the result was no further action was taken. So after five months, although, as you said, a, a great deal of information was, was discovered, no comment could be made on it, and further work couldn't be undertaken to discover uh, what these important pieces of information actually meant. A verdict has brought us to a height, but at the same time, it has brought us to the foothills of the challenges, of the, of the issues that we need to look at clearly. And this can only be done and resolved by an independent inquiry, which we've been asking for in the past five and a half years. The authorities need to be held to account for what they knew, what they were or weren't doing, and why they were or weren't doing it. This, however, is still an uphill battle that the government and media fail to address. MI5, who were not challenged or cross-examined at the inquest, have rejected recommendations put forward by the families to help prevent this happening in the future. James EDQC arrogantly stated, The evidence simply does not give rise to any concern about other deaths in the future or continuing risk. This echoes the King's Cross Underground Fire of 1987, where the authorities failed to implement recommendations even by 2005. Rather than becoming more transparent about their actions and protocols, and more importantly their collusion with the very terrorists we're supposed to be protected from, in November 2011, Foreign Secretary William Haig revealed plans to restrict further the ability of courts to discuss in public the work of MI5 and MI6. He suggested intelligence data should only be discussed in secret court hearings. If that was the case following 7-7, we may not have been privy to most of the information covered in this report. What exactly are they trying to hide? In the future, if we are to prevent or get to the bottom of events like 7-7 and the context which surrounds them, it will require an informed and questioning public that aren't afraid to hold their government's feet to the fire. Because if we don't, it's the people that will get burned. Nothing's what it seems 